computer. Okay. Good. Yeah, I saw I, I saw most of your fuzzy top there. <laughs> there we are. That's a bit better. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. 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 Um, yeah. Good. Good day. Um, welcome to uh, Talking Smart Conversations with uh, educators and philosophers from around the world. Uh, I, I'm Mort Morehouse, and uh, I'm the host of the uh, YouTube channel. Today's guest is Ivor Goodson. And I will uh, turn aside and read a little bit because I can't remember all of your grand things uh, for your introduction. But Ivor has been involved in education uh, actually around the world. Uh, I met him in Canada and uh, 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 when he was teaching there. Uh, he's taught in the United States. He's taught in uh, Estonia. Um, and he's been uh, a, uh, he's been at the Max Planck Institute, which is pretty impressive, and the uh, Paris uh, Study for Politics, um, IEP, because I, I don't know my French very well, um, and uh, he's been involved with the uh, Education Research Center uh, in the University of Brighton, and particularly the University of Tallman, is that how Tallinn. you it? Tallinn, yeah. Yes, and... Uh, so, at any rate, uh, and he's uh, well known for his work in narrative and storytelling, and uh, so that's kind of where we'll begin. Uh, and it's kind of interesting that um, we share um, a, a sort of a Finnic connection, because I did uh, some work in Finland uh, back in the back in the day, um, and you now are doing a lot of work in Estonia, so. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, first of all, though, I want to thank you very much, you and Malcolm Clarkson, uh, for helping me uh, <laughs> advance my career, the, your work, uh, helping me uh, get the uh, uh, be beginning qualitative research off the ground uh, was invaluable. So thank you very much. <clears throat> And I should also thank you for your work for analytic teaching, because uh, that also was a very important. And we're still going. The oldest uh, ongoing uh, publication related to uh, community of inquiry and philosophy for children. So, uh, how many years, Mark? How many years has that gone on? It started um, uh, in 1980. Um, and probably in the second issue, um, I had an article published in it, um, and then I said to uh, um, Ron Reed, who was the editor at the time, um, "How about how about uh, having some book reviews?" And he said, yeah. "Okay, you're the book review um, <laughs> editor." <laughs> so, so, and then I became a, a co-editor and then editor, and, and I was right. editor from about nineteen uh, nineteen ninety ish until uh, 2012, I think so. Uh, oh, pretty good book. Yeah, pretty good go. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So so um, I, I want to talk to you about, I thought maybe an interesting place to start. I want to explore all kinds of stuff about education too, but uh, I'm interested in how your approach to narrative is different from other people's approach to narrative. And I think particularly... Um, about uh, Dan McAdams uh, and uh, uh, Ruth Allen uh, uh, J Jasselson, uh, yeah. big and and I and I've done a little work with uh, with McAdams, uh, and so I'm interested in seeing how your approach is is different from them. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the the big difference is is not so much with. McAdam's work with which I concur broadly but with the a lot of the narrative work that comes out of Canada for example Connolly and Clandanin which is mostly concerned with uh, capturing the voice of the teacher as the authentic voice of the self a reasonable aspiration but it concentrates pretty much on the life story as told um, and my concern always has been to 
double up on that, to have, as I say, capture the story of action within a theory of context. Yeah. And that's actually where I think I share similar ground in some ways with McAdam, who also provides a pretty rich psychological context to a lot of the work. My my notion of context is more historical. So maybe the most important distinction, Mort, is between life story, which some people regard as the total works for narrative, and life history, which provides a historical context for the way the story is being told. So it doesn't take the story as an authentic rendition of facticity. It takes it as a story and tries to end, understand why the story is being told that way at that time in that place. So it situates the story historically. And I think without that context, we fall prey to narrative simply being um, at the whim of those that actually construct the context. So let me give you an example. Um, if you just told the teacher's story, the stories that were told by teachers in the 60s would be broadly stories about agentic teachers who had control of the curriculum and had a degree of autonomy, a degree of professional trust, and were allowed to do many of the things that they thought were good for the children. If you fast forward it and you just look at the story, the story teachers tell me, certainly in England now, is a story of essentially technicians who obey government guidelines and follow the dictates of people in power. Now, if you just stuck with the story, you wouldn't understand this huge contextual change that's gone on. So that kind of narrative leads to political quietitude, to political non-saying, to no analysis of political change. And I'm, for all sorts of reasons, find that inadequate. So there's a long answer to a short question, Walt. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, it, it is it is interesting. I think I think the that that's so much a problem of understanding all kinds of conversations in and out of education. I mean, you know, maybe it's uh, something that uh, I've just come by because I've accumulated uh, eighty some odd years uh, of life experience, but. You know, I think about within education, within politics, um, and and, and uh, maybe uh, see if this example makes sense. It's just interesting doing intergenerational stuff. When uh, when Trump was elected uh, in the United States, uh, my my daughter and her partner um, were just hair hair on fire about what was happening with Trump. And, you know, we had to remind them that there was McCarthy, uh, that there was uh, FBI people investigating Martin Luther King uh, Jr. And <clears throat> all of those contexts and various, and, and, and so it's not that the Trump situation wasn't important and frightening in some ways, but it's a part of a larger history that I think they didn't fit well into their personal understanding of of the moment, even. And it's just probably a different perspective, maybe. Maybe that's not consistent with your... No, I think, I think it's perfectly relevant. And it, it reminds me more, this is going to stand, sound anti-American, it's not at all, believe me. But I watched a program, I think it was on David Letterman, where he was introducing and interviewing a British playwright called David Hare. Okay. And they were trying to get at the differences between English irony and American optimism, mm. something that appeals enormously to us, the optimism of the Americans. But he ended up saying this, David Letterman, he said, so what is it you think is missing in American life that you think exists in English life. And he said, what is missing 
is a serious theory of evil. He yeah. said, you're such a wonderful, optimistic people that you tend to gloss over periods of evil like McCarthyism or slavery or other things. Yeah, yeah. Without a theory of evil, you can't understand the human condition. It's not only about evil, of course, it's about goodness and civil rights and, and all of the nice things that humans bring to the table. But without understanding the other side of human behavior, you're lost. You're lost without meaning. And of course, when you get to 80, as we both have, you understand that in a very profound way. Um, but it's trying to find a methodology, therefore, which provides you with that contextual understanding which is almost Shakespearean in saying, I understand human goodness and human good intentions, and I'm in favor of these reforms, but I also understand human badness and the sort of people in power who will want to stop this happening. And mm. unless I understand both, yeah. I'm nowhere. And my, my life story then is meaningless unless it has a life history element. Yeah, yes, yes. No, I, I think that's... That's exactly the kind of thing that I keep going back to because it it's surprising. And that happens not only with um, national politics, it also happens on a local level. Uh, yeah. It's surprising that people can live in a city for many, many, many years and have no sense of the historical development uh, of that area and, and how it impacts what's going on today and how they interact with each other uh, you know that, i mean that's why jane jacobs book was so wonderful do you remember the death of the american city oh yes, I mean, yes she always had this wonderful historical understanding of what had happened to american cities and what's significant is that her last book published in 2002 was called was called the new dark age and she foresaw historically exactly the dark age that we're going into. I don't want to be a miserable old chap because I'm optimistic about the future. But in some ways, it is a dark age. And she foresaw Trumpian politics. She foresaw some of the awful people that came to power in England. Um, she foresaw that there was a dark age which would move beyond truth. And indeed, what she fore foresaw, because she'd done history, was a theory of potential evil as well as potential good. And unless you're cognizant of that, you vote for these people um, and you get what you deserve. Yeah, and I, and I think, well, we, I interviewed just uh, last week uh, um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Rick Kite, and he's an ethicist at the Terrible. Um, yeah. and very good, capable guy, but one of his columns, he writes a local column on ethics, and one of the columns he talked about um, that he thought students who were liberal tended to be pessimistic, um, and as opposed to the conservative students who tend to be more optimistic. And I think part of that is because so many people, I don't know if I agree with the premise, but I think what is at the bottom of both of those is just that issue, that to me, a liberal is a person who recognizes that the evil is possible and, and that has experienced some of that and can still be in the fight, so to speak, can still be saying, OK, yes, this is bad, but this is what needs to be done. And, and to me, that what needs to be done is an optimistic perspective but colored by uh, uh, some kind of an awareness that that things have been bad and could get worse. Uh, I don't yeah, know. I think that's true. But it, it, I mean, one of the things I've been working on recently is what I call the crisis of positionality, to use one of those posh academic phrases. But broadly, it boils down to this. If you imagine the kind of times that in our early life you and I lived through, they were broadly a progress narrative. Things were getting better um, and liberal people were on the side of change in a quite dramatic way. We've now moved into a regress narrative mm -hmm. where every change makes things worse, broadly. 
Now, that actually stands traditional politics on its head. It inverts it. Because what it means is if the changes that are being put in place are making things worse, conservative people will want those changes and liberals will be opposed to them. This is a complete inverse of the way liberals once were. They were in progressives were in favor of reform. Now we're in favor of staying put because we know the changes are going to make it bloody worse. <laughs> and that's a complete inversion. And we need to wrestle with that. It's what I call the crisis of positionality. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, that's, 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 that's interesting. And well, you know, bringing up those academic terms, uh, this is a thing that I've been struggling with and in, in, in trying to figure out uh, how to deal with it. Um, and that has to do with, um, and now I, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, positionality. Uh, you know, that's a really interesting uh, perspective. But I think one of the other things that happens in terms of how things get confused is people um, don't have a, a hand. It's a word, positionality is a word that sounds academic, therefore not understandable, and, and therefore uh, posh and, and um, I don't know, uh, ignorant in some, some interesting ways. And so rather than anybody trying to explain that in everyday English language, uh, people say it's that or it's that, and nobody understands what the other thing, every person is talking. It's like uh, woke, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same kind of work. Of war. No, I accept that. I accept that. Yeah. And, yeah, I get that. But yeah. I mean, always the knack is to, is to, I think the knack of lectures is to put a word up there and everybody reacts the way that you're saying. They think, oh, I don't know what that means. It's woke stuff. And then boil it down to the very commonsensical thing of it being a regress narrative or a progress narrative. Once you do that, you actually expose academic jargon and you bring it down to people's kind of understanding of the world as it is. That That's the knack of being a decent communicator. Yes, but there's so little of that, at least in the United States. As, uh, yeah. I, I think we have tended to leap into the fight and, and defended that without... Uh, even bothering to 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 understand it in a, a certain and certainly not to rearticulate it in the ways that make sense to uh, your average well any person actually who's not an academic. Uh, but I think that's the virtue, if I might say so, more to work on people's life histories because. Yes. Instead of trying to deal with big ideas and ideologies and macro narratives and all the kind of things that get designated as woke, you're actually generating simple stories that people tell themselves about the world. Now, it's a little more difficult for those who would wish to dismiss that as woke or whatever to dismiss it, because what you would effectively be doing is dismissing somebody's experience of the world. Now, of course, that is what powerful constituencies seek to do, but it's quite hard to do it front on because you come back with the answer, which I've said a million times in, in lectures. So you're not interested in what people think then. You don't want to hear their life stories. That's a hard one to say, no, we're not interested. But once you're drawn in and you listen, you get kind of truths that matter. Uh, truths of how people are subjectively experiencing the world. That's always valuable data. Mm -hmm. And it was, val I mean, it's interesting to look at the history of life history. I mean, I've done a lot of work on that. Came out of Chicago, came out of that school where they were trying to understand the city, Robert Park and all of those great sociologists, most of whom were mm -hmm. actually kicked out from Chicago because they were doing such wonderful work. Yeah. Um, but actually, they founded the life history and they came up with this incredibly 
counterintuitive way of interrogating the city and the powerful people in the city. No wonder people don't like qualitative methods because it lays out what people are feeling and it gives them a voice. And that's a, you know, Studs Terkel knew this. This is a powerful way to proceed. And um, of course, it arouses a lot of antagonism among positivist groups and theoretical groups, but it's actually the nub of the issue of life. Yeah, well, yes. Well, that that's that's a really uh, uh, helpful, uh, and and I suppose there are those people. I shouldn't dismiss all of the people and and who try to bridge that, and and you find good columnists who uh, actually have a really good knack for that, and 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 sometimes I mean, George, George Will does that in in yes. America. I mean, you've got some great columnists who tune straight into stories. Yes, yes. Well, you know, George Will is one of those people that um, uh, he used to have a regular column in, in uh, Newsweek magazine. And he was one of the few conservatives that I almost always read because yeah. I knew that there was some truth in there. And there's also something that I could um, make an uh, alternate argument for. Um, and those were things that I really enjoyed engaging. Uh, yeah, I'm not. A I'm not just interested in in right wing stories. In fact, I like Vance's book Hill Hillbilly Elegy, even though he's turned out to be politically the opposite of what I want. I'm not interested in left and right. I'm interested in somebody who comes to me understanding the human condition. They may draw on different conclusions as George does and Vance does. I don't mind. That me, I, what I do, what I do want is them to wrestle with the human condition and listen to people. I don't mind if you come out left or right at the end of it, but for God's sake, listen. And some of those politicians that are in control now, they don't listen to a soul. Can you imagine Johnson or Trump listening to anybody ever? <laughs> no, no, no. And, and you know, and, and of course, Johnson is our senator, one of our senators. Fortunately, <laughs> we have Tammy Baldwin too, but. Um, uh, Johnson is is so uh, unwilling to to listen to even himself. That's I mean he he, he can't even articulate his own positions, um, and it's very frustrating. And we back in the day um, at the beginning of the uh, Trump uh, presidency. There was a group of people that got together that tried to be non-political and engage people in, in conversations about all kinds of uh, all kinds of things. And among them, um, uh, there's a group from La Crosse that went down to talk to Johnson's staff. And it turns out that apparently Johnson's staff uh, is was quite good, at least according to them, of listening. To what people had to say, and but it never no. even got up to, to 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 Johnson himself, and never uh, trickled up. No, no never tri trickled up. Yes, yes. Well, that yeah, and I th I think about this, uh, you know, how um, stories and uh, um, those kind of things play into this, and a part of perhaps the place that I developed some of my political perspective was my dad was a machinist. And one of the things after a long strike, they actually joined the machinist union rather than uh, AFL, CIO, whatever it was at the time. And uh, Whippensinger, uh, who was a, a democratic socialist, was the president yeah. of the machinist yeah. union. And he had a little column in the I don't know, weekly train paper. The train was a manufacturing company in La Crosse. And he would tell these stories, uh, labor stories. And it was uh, just a really interesting hook to get you interested in all, all kinds of things. And it, it, it then that thing opens up all kinds of things to as they say, inquiring minds, you know. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm just reading a life story of Eugene Debs as we speak. Oh. So, I mean, it uh, getting to work out why some people are reflexive and why some people draw 
interesting conclusions about how to help the human condition continues to utterly fascinate me. Oh, yeah. And as I say, they may draw different conclusions to my conclusions. I don't care. But as long as they're reflected, and as long as they're engaging with human subjectivity, I'm on board for them. Um, but what I see now is a world where people are encouraged not to be reflective, they're encouraged not to engage with any notion of truth, and they're encouraged just to vent opinionated, free-floating, non-contextual knowledge without a theory of context. As we said earlier, you're done. You're just a free-floating opinion in the middle of nowhere. Yes, yes, yes. Well, well my goodness, I can't believe this. We, um, we're, we're, we've almost done a half hour already, but um, maybe we can, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to take this too long because um, these have been fairly successful, I think, and people have been listening to them, but I think if it gets much more than a half hour, that won't be the case. But anyway, anything... Telling me I'm talking too much. That's what oh, you're telling no, me. No, no, I'm the one that's talking too much. <laughs> um, um, what, why, why don't we try to see if we can uh, come up with may, maybe that you sort of made a conclusion, but um, yeah, uh, see, if, see, re restate that idea about stories and contextuality. To to, to uh, uh, I suppose what I'm saying in terms of people's understanding of their world, which is a central starting point for any social scientist or politician or human being, the best way to, to really get a handle on what's going on inside somebody, that their inner life, is to, is to engage with this, the stories they tell themselves. I think their, their narrative story is the is their inner life laid out for you and if you don't understand your, your own inner life and you don't understand other people's inner lives and you don't understand the meanings that they're making you can't respond in any meaningful way to their needs yeah, yeah. i think that's an excellent summary and i will uh, end this officially, and then maybe we can just chat for a couple of minutes uh, after the recording is over. If I can find the right button here. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I think that 